advice of the Museums Association, and I think in particular their um, Code of Ethics. So it um, is really relevant in the areas where it says museums should be accessible to all, should use collections for public benefit, should minimise or balance bias in interpretation, and should engage and work in partnership with communities and as wide an audience as possible. So it's therefore necessary to consider these standards for the new Buddhist room displays and to consider current approaches in displaying Buddhist material in museums. The mission of the Dennis Air Bao bequest or the castle is to preserve Bao's collections in his home for the benefit of the public. But my main question when planning the Buddhist room displays was, should we continue to display the collection as Dennis did? So I conducted research into Dennis's displays and his understanding of the Buddhist collection. And um, I focused in particular on the Tibetan objects because they do make up just over half of the collection. And I looked into the kind of resources on Buddhist art and Buddhism that were available to Dennis at the time and the attitudes that he may have been influenced by. And the aim was to decide basically on the most appropriate way of um, redisplaying the collection. So although Dennis did not leave us an accessions register, um, he did leave notes and labels and letters and newspaper clippings and all sorts of um, interesting resources in the archive. And um, these have really formed a key resource into understanding what Dennis thought about his collection and what he knew about um, the collection. And this notebook that you can see on the screen is one of those really, really important resources. So um, Dennis wrote in it whilst he was in prison and he listed kind of key objects from his Buddhist collection from memory. And um, it's, it's interesting, it gives us really an initial idea as to what he valued and how he kind of viewed his collection. So you can see that he noted um, the kind of estimated value of each object and he really used um, kind of auction catalogue style language so it's clear that he was also viewing his collection from the perspective of um, an antiques business owner. And then there's also this really interesting letter in the archive from Alexandra David Nell, a famous 20th century explorer in Tibet. Um, it appears that Dennis asked her to translate one of the inscriptions on one of his tankers or Tibetan paintings, um, and then she replied with this letter. And he kept it with a um, newspaper clipping of her obituary, so he clearly admired her, and books in the library suggest he was particularly fascinated by Tibet and exploration in Tibet, which was a popular interest in the West in the early 20th century when Dennis began collecting. And um, the library books, his um, books that he left um, with the castle are a really useful resource as well. Um, so amongst the books are accounts of the British Young Husband Expedition um, of 1903 to 1904, which was sent to establish trade relations with Tibet, but was notorious for the violence and looting carried out by the British troops. And there's also a copy of the late 19th century work Buddhism of Tibet, or Lamaism, by L. Austin Waddell, which was a popular Victorian period guide to Tibetan Buddhism and collecting Tibetan objects, but it did present a derogatory and orientalist attitude. Um, the library mostly consists of reference books that Dennis used for his four main collections. So it is reasonable to assume that Dennis would have used these kind of books as references to inform his collecting. So it's important to note that Dennis identified as a Buddhist. Um, so we have here a letter from the Buddhist visitor of Wormwood Scrubs Prison um, addressed to Dennis. And Dennis's Buddhist beliefs were actually apparently used as an argument in his defense at his trial. Um, and we also have many of Dennis's copies of the Buddhist Society Journal issues still at the castle. Um, according to the book Beyond Belief, which was written by a close friend of Dennis's, Mary Eldridge, about their kind of relationship, um, 
Dennis was close friends with Christmas Humphreys, the founder of the Buddhist Society. And the book states that Dennis and Christmas Humphreys were both Buddhists, but Dennis apparently was just a romantic who was attracted by the beautiful imagery of Buddhism. Um, it's really interesting that the many, many of the articles and adverts in these copies of the Buddhist Society journal that Dennis um, kept, again reflected attitudes towards Tibet and Buddhism typical of the early to mid 20th century. So um, the kind of themes that come across quite strongly are a focus on Western interpretations of Buddhism, comparing Buddhist ideas with Western psychology, and there are also quite a few adverts for the Theosophical Society, um, the Theosophical Society Bookshop, um, which was a society founded in the late 19th century in America, which focused on exploring the occult, magic, and Eastern religions. So again, all these things just give us an idea as to what kind of um, influences Dennis would have been kind of exposed to. So these are some photographs of Dennis's Buddhist room, which is actually now the Egyptian room at the castle today, because the rooms have been sort of moved around a few times since Dennis lived at the castle. Um, and we can really see from these photographs that Dennis displayed his collections in a cabinet of curiosities style. So he had objects crowded into these wooden cabinets with a few labels dotted here and there. Um, and he occasionally appears to have displayed objects of similar types together. So for example, prayer wheels or statues of the Buddha, but there does not appear to have been any particular themes or narratives explored in the displays. Now, I'll just mention quickly a bit of the history of the Cabinet of Curiosities. So um, these were rooms or cabinets in which natural history collections and curiosities from around the world were displayed, which became popular in the homes of the wealthy in Europe in the 15th century. And the aim was to really collect and classify strange, rare or mysterious objects to understand more about the world. And the owner of the cabinet could invite friends and acquaintances to view it, and they could really sort of show off their collection and impress visitors with their ability to bring all of these objects together into their home. So in a similar way, the aim with Dennis's displays appears to have been to impress his visitors with the quantity and the beauty of the objects rather than to provide information on their original context or meaning. Um, you can really see the Cabinet of Curiosities um, style is kind of echoed in the way he had objects hanging from the ceiling or placed on the mantelpiece or on benches or even on the floor, just really sort of filling the whole room with his um, Buddhist collection. And these are just a few more photographs from the archive which illustrate how Dennis displayed and treated his Buddhist collection before he moved to the castle. Um, you can see Buddha statues crowded onto his favourite desk at home in Derbyshire, and um, you can kind of get the sense that his Buddhist collection was a key part of his identity, and he really lived surrounded by his collection in his home. So another great resource is Dennis's labels, which he wrote by hand. Um, so he did include a few labels in his displays, which kind of give a brief introduction to the objects, but it's clear that they have um, little or no explanation of terms or sort of historical background. And there are also labels which, as with the, um, some of the articles in the Buddhist Society Journal issues that he would have read, focused on the mysterious and magical image of Tibetan Buddhism and demonstrated a Western or Christianity-centric attitude towards the objects. Um, a good example is the label for a um, Tibetan deity, Peldon Lamo, who is described in Dennis's uh, label as the great she devil. That's, that's one example. Um, then just below is a label written about Dennis's display, is most likely by early custodians or trustees of the castle after Dennis died. Um, and it basically sums up Dennis's displays quite well. So it explained that Dennis considered the context and 
and the history of the objects to be of secondary importance to their aesthetic qualities, um, and that does come across again clearly in his displays. Um, it appears that he also used his imagination in his um, labels as well. So it describes how Dennis used to call a vessel in his collection the Dalai Lama's teapot, um, whereas this label obviously appears to be skeptical as to whether or not that's correct. So these are some images of the Buddhist room today and a few different versions of the displays that we've had over the past few years. So really the main conclusion of my research into the archive was that the way in which Dennis displayed and interpreted his Buddhist collection erased or obscured the object's original context, meaning and in particular sacred significance. Um, his understanding and interpretation of the collection appears to have been influenced by early to mid 20th century attitudes towards Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism in general, which tended to view it from a position of colonial superiority. So the aim with the new Buddhist displays at the castle was to move away from presenting the objects solely as Dennis's curiosities and to explain the original context and uses and significance of the objects to the people who made and, and used them and um, to Buddhist people today. Um, so we wanted to add further voices and, and perspectives into the displays. So I researched the way in which Buddhist objects are displayed and treated in other museums. And um, one key change that I'll just mention that we've made following this research and consultation of members of the Buddhist community was no longer placing statues at floor level. Because we did used to have um, quite a few statues kind of crowded into the bottom shelf of one of the display cases, which were basically at um, floor level, because um, we have learned that statues, if possible, should be placed sort of at eye level or above. Um, and that's because once consecrated, a statue of a deity is treated with the same level of respect and care as if it were the deity itself. So that's one of the key kind of changes that we've made in the room. I will just talk a little bit about a few practical considerations, however, because um, you know we are in a historic house setting. We have quite limited resources and members of staff, unfortunately, and display space available. Um, one of the things we had to consider was the weight and size of some of the statues. So um, obviously, changing that um, kind of level of display meant that some of the statues currently can't be displayed, but we're working on trying to raise the funds for a new display case to solve that issue. And there are also various sort of condition issues that needed to be considered and the environmental conditions in the castle and so on. So I'll just talk a little bit about one project in particular um, to redisplay the collection of tankers or Tibetan paintings at the castle. So Dennis owned around 13 tankers um, these are paintings which can be rolled up and transported or hung in a sort of altar or temple setting. And they usually depict a central deity surrounded by associated deities or um, sometimes a lineage or, or story of a, a particular important teacher. Um, so Dennis mostly displayed his tankers in these kind of glazed Western style picture frames. Apologies for the slightly strange angle of that photograph, I hope it gives you an idea. Um, and again, this is kind of an illustration of the Western style display of these tankers. So um, they've been adapted and altered to fit um, within these glazed picture frames. And we unfortunately discovered when we had some of them removed from the frames that they've been folded and kind of taped into the frames with masking tape, which obviously is not very good for them from a um, you know, preservation perspective as well. So following the removal of some of the tankers from the frames and um, the conservation of some of them, we wanted to find a way of displaying them that would take into consideration their sacred significance. So if possible, we wanted to display them without altering or damaging them further. Um, one suggestion that we did not um, choose was, for example, stitching them to a mount board, which obviously would 
kind of alter or damage the original fabric and also would prevent us from viewing the backs of the tankers. And um, most of them have really beautiful different fabrics on the back of them and inscriptions and even one has a handprint as well. So there's really, really important information um, that can be found on the backs of the tankers as well. So we worked with a conservator, Karen Horton, who specialises in tankers and who works on the um, tankers collection at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. And she developed this um, magnet mount system for them. So they're basically adhered to a magnetic backboard with um, colour matched magnets so that they can be put on display and removed without causing any damage or um, intervention to the original material. And they can be removed from display really, really easily to be able to view um, the backs of them. And because we have such limited display space in the Buddhist room, we're only able to display one at a time. So it does just mean that it's very easy to you know, put them on display and, and take them off again. So I just wanted to talk a bit about that project in particular. So in order to ensure that we're displaying the Buddhist collection accurately and respectfully and to bring other voices and perspectives into the displays other than just Dennis's voice, um, we have consulted members of the Buddhist and Tibetan communities in the UK on the new displays. So in 2018 and 2019 we organised visits for members of the Buddhist group Bodhichaya Kent which is led by the Tibetan Buddhist master Rungo Tilpa Rinpoche. And the members viewed some of the stored collection and were able to spend some time in the Buddhist room for practice as well. And we were honoured that Rungo Tilpa Rinpoche was able to visit to view the collection. So the photographs just show some of the stored statues arranged for a viewing as part of an event. Um, a prayer wheel which was donated for educational purposes and handling by a member of Bodhichaira and a note written on one of their tanka inscriptions by Rungu Tukul Rinpoche. Um, and in 2022, Nick facilitated a visit from Sedin Pasang um, and Tashi and Pemba Murik, who were very honoured, were able to join us this evening, um, who are members of the Tibetan community in the UK. So their visit informed the current display and interpretation of the collection in the Buddhist room. So we viewed some of the Tibetan collection, they advised on how we could adapt and improve the displays. And um, I've included some images of their visit here as well. Um, great, so I will now hand over to Nick to speak more about this visit and his research into decolonization and the display of Buddhist material in museums. <laughs> thanks, Naomi, and um, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, so, last year I had published um, an, an article in a journal for the Buddhist Association of Study Religion, which I understand that several people in the room have actually read, which is uh, simultaneously flattering but mildly terrifying in terms of um, I'm not sure what kind of questions I'm going to get at the end of this session. So I didn't want to just regurgitate that paper. You can read it, you have read it, that, that's all fine. But I want to kind of give, um, uh, say, extend on some of the ideas that are in that paper on, on either, either end of it, but also um, harmonise with some of the things within that. So give a bit more context to, uh, to that paper and to the uh, decolonisation exercise that I helped to facilitate at Chillington as well. So I'll talk specifically about that, but a little bit of, of other sort of lectury things I was subject to. <coughs> Excuse me. So I began the article with a quote from Jonathan Walters, the um, North American historian of religion with a focus on Buddhism and Buddhism in Sri Lanka. I, um, I saw him give a keynote speech at a conference a few years ago, and I, I haven't seen him publish anything on that, the subject matter from that keynote speech, but it was fascinating because he focused on um, the, the way that uh, Christian missionaries, British Christian missionaries, uh, tried to frame Buddhism um, and also Islam, in order to kind of uh, make Christianity the, the obvious, the natural choice for the people of Sri Lanka. So Buddhism was framed as being something that's passive, um, that's very kind of airy, fairy, head in the clouds, spiritual, um, you know, do what you want kind of, kind of ideas, almost the point of being a feat, 
Um, Islam was configured as being uh, bounded by rules, very strict, and also very aggressive. So it was seen as the, the opposite to Buddhism. And Christianity op operated in kind of a sweet spot in the middle of that, as having enough laws and regulations, but enough room for spirituality. This is how missionaries were trying to configure things. So I don't think we need to look too far um, away from recent headlines to see how those ideas about Islam have stuck in the, in the public consciousness in the UK. And maybe some of the ideas about Buddhism are in there too. Um, he, goes on, he went on to talk about specifically this, uh, this hymn, this missionary hymn, written by Reginald Heber, who spent three years in Sri Lanka. Um, I've just got the first two verses of it here, but you can see how um, the, the first verse refers to things like Greenland's icy mountains, um, Africa's sunny fountains, and he's talking about kind of indigenous groups and their own kind of understanding of the cosmos and religion, etc., et um, and how they're wrong, they're, they're, they're in error, then errors chain. So there's, there's that sort of um, that frame of those ideas there. The second verse is specifically about Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Um, and you see the last two lines of that, it says, the heathen in his blindness bows down to a wooden stone. So in Heber's understanding, that material culture of Sri Lanka, of Buddhist images in wood or stone, that people might make prostrations to in order to show respect, to, to gain punya, gain merit, etc., um, are just that. There's nothing you seen as being purely a physical thing, and it's something that kind of um, uh, an infantilized person might do. So I thought introducing that section there is um, is relevant because of the material culture dimensions of the, the MA here, and also Chinese and Castle and the Buddhist um, items there to, to extend on what um, uh, what Waters um, produced. I, I do strongly recommend that people read Jonathan Waters if you want to get a good idea about the context of Buddhism um, in. in of Western understandings of, of, of Buddhism. Um, I talked a little bit, my favorite, a little bit about kind of um, the, uh, the sort of hinge points of early understandings of Buddhism uh, in, in Europe, obviously, we're talking about that, um, that came through colonial sources and how many of those ideas have a great deal of traction. And as um, People learn more, I study Buddhism more, learn more about Buddhism, I've spoke to actual Buddhists, etc. Um, those ideas changed in a sort of post war period, but the early ideas seem to have kind of got stuck. Um, I should also point out, so, so Schopenhauer um, maybe exemplifies the idea that, that Buddhism is pessimistic or something like that. I, mean, I think if you only read the, the first. Um, uh, noble truth, then yeah, sure, Buddhism is pessimistic. But if you read on beyond that, you'll see it actually has a solution as well. Um, and uh, Edwin Arnold, with his uh, Lights of Asia poem, you know, one of the most, um, uh, say, widely read works about Buddhist, the, the, the life of the Buddha, in Victorian England, um, a very famous piece of work that would have informed people about uh, the, the Buddha's life and what Buddhism's about, written in very kind of um, uh, fanciful, florid uh, language in places, uh, is another, let's say, um, uh, factor that feeds into how Bauer understood uh, Buddhism. And also I picked these two because I talk about the long 19th century in that article, and it, this kind of covers most of it. it typically, like, you know, there's no definite finishing point, but maybe the beginning of the First World War is seen as being the finish of the long 19th century, but I've got to stretch that out across there. Um, so, I'll come back to some of the things. I was going to say, it's a bit like um, with these early ideas of, um, of, of Buddhism from the first part of the 19th century and colonial kind of legacy ideas, um, it's, it's frustrating for academics who hear um, these, these ideas repeated. And I do, come, I, I do speak about some specific ones a bit later. And I think it's a little bit like when um, uh, I can vaguely remember as a kid going through the dinosaur phase and you're, you're sort of playing with bottles of dinosaurs. I don't know if anybody else did this, I'm sure some people did. Uh, so you've got like a, a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus and you're making them fight. And that, I mean, there's no way that could happen because they're separated by hundreds of millions of years. But nonetheless, that, those ideas kind of stick. You think, oh, but why can't a, a T-Rex fight a Stegosaurus? And it's, it's that sort of misunderstanding that just gets lodged and to be honest, for, for many people, those ideas, they're not very important in their day-to-day -day life. They come and go out of their sort of, um, a field of view, and they don't have a big impact on their lives. So they don't really care particularly about up updating their, their data. But it's, it's that, that sort of thing gets stuck with, with Buddhist ideas from the, kind of, let's say, the pre-war period. Um, and one person who um, 
was very influential on Bauer, as we've heard already, was Christmas Humphreys. I think these, these two quotes do appear in, in the article, uh, but they're worth um, revisiting here. So the idea that there's never been a Buddhist war, nor has any man been killed or even injured by a Buddhist for holding a different point of view, that's highly contentious. Uh, but nonetheless, Humphreys is there as the president of the Buddhist Society uh, from, the, from its founding until his death. And so he's there as a spokesperson for Buddhism. He's telling people what Buddhism is about. And so these ideas do. And the second one about, um, uh, say, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, saying, lying as it does on the fringe of the Buddhist world, this school was unaffected by development elsewhere. Ooh, I don't think anybody in Sri Lanka would like to think of themselves as being on the fringe of the Buddhist world. They're at the centre of their Buddhist world, and, and it's, it seems to be a very um, objectifying, uh, colonial uh, approach to understanding um, the religion, of, religion in Sri Lanka. And this is the kind of Buddhism that Bauer would have been, like, would have encountered. So, um, aesthetically pleasing, as, 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 as Naomi pointed out in his um, uh, in, in talk, and uh, you know, pacifistic as well, and so on. I'm not going to talk too much about Buddhist modernism. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. I forgot what time I started. If, if I start to run on, just let me know. But I kind of, I should be able to keep, sit, sit about 20 minutes. Uh, but I haven't timed this. Um, so Buddhist modernism is a term that, that hopefully some of you are familiar with, and it really refers to this idea that uh, Buddhism as encountered in colonial situations is a, is, is a, kind of, is a construct of its own. So um, in the face of hostility by missionaries and, and others, uh, Buddhists in, say, Sri Lanka particularly, tended to try to present Buddhism as being like entirely rational. They came up with a new way of understanding Buddhist thought and Buddhist practice that was in line with Western rational thought and in line with science. And ideas about, say, um, uh, non-human entities or, uh, or worship, etc., uh, were just local cultural things, hangovers that satisfied some people in a simplistic kind of way. They weren't an integral part of, of Buddhist um, practice and so forth. Um, so this was identified in the, in the 1960s by Heinz Becker, the, the German um, uh, methodologist Heinz Becker, uh, who kind of set a different kind of context which I want to understand, well, well what is it that we do know about Buddhism then? If, it, well, if, that's, if those ideas were coming through in the first part of the 20th century, and that's not really how Buddhism was practiced in the countries before colonialism, what is it that we kind of really, uh, what, let, let's look again at the data that we have and try and find a new way to, to understand Buddhism. Furthermore, trying to understand Buddhism on its own terms as well, but I'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, I should also add, as to, uh, for clarification purposes, that most of the things I've talked about so far is a case of European intellectuals who have encountered Buddhist thought and practice and who've turned up in their, well, back in Europe, say, and they're telling people what Buddhism is. And these, uh, it would be fallacious to think that they, they discovered Buddhism, or they were, the first, they were the first kind of Europeans to encounter Buddhist ideas, because that becomes like social history that goes back way before the 19th century, where you have um, encounters through trade routes, etc., with, um, with, with the Buddhist world. And you also have uh, Europeans who become monks in the say, late 19th century, early, um, early 20th century, who are nothing to, they're not high profile, they're not trying to sell books, they're not trying to get a uh, lecturing post in the UK or something like that, or proselytize. They just uh, became attracted to, to uh, Buddhism, Buddhist thought, Buddhist practice, Buddhist life, and just renounced the world and became monks. And they're, they're there. there was a project in, at some uh, Cork University um, to find, to, to identify um, people who uh, became uh, Buddhist monks and nuns in, in, um, that, that aren't really on the radar, to answer if, uh, kind of rock star figures in, in Buddhist history. Um, so yes, we have these disjunctures between the, the, the sort of pre-war, post-war ideas about what Buddhism is. Um, so on to decoloniality, I'll come back to those disjunctures in a, in a moment. Um, I, came up with, I, I thought, when looking at the decolonization exercise that uh, we did at Chillingston, and when thinking about decoloniality in general, it struck me that there's, there's not just one type, there's a kind of, there seems to be a difference between um, activist uh, decolonizing practices, um, such as repatriation of human remains from museums, 
And as I say, fortunately, I, I, I don't go from the Food in every cupboard in the museum, but hopefully you haven't found anything in there that you, you sort of think that shouldn't be here. Um, or, uh, or say, um, activities like, say, like uh, Rose Must Fall, etc. Those kinds of, of activities. And the more um, educational side of it. So I thought that there's a distinction there between sort of hard decoloniality and soft decoloniality. I was thinking of soft decoloniality, it's a bit like sort of soft power. So it's a, it's a sort of a gentle suggestions here and there to try to influence people rather than saying, here's an agenda, we want these results at the very end of it, and that, 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 those, those sorts of things. Um, a colleague of mine at the University of South Wales, a former colleague, uh, gave a really good description of what decoloniality is, particularly, say, soft decoloniality. And he said it's like if you're trying to, um, uh, if you're trying to explore a cave and you've got, say, one candle, and you're walking around it, you can see the shapes and the contours of the walls, and maybe there's a drawing here or there or something like that, and you get a, a sense of what the cave is about. That's like the kind of the, um, the uh, colonised approach, if you like, just, just the one candle. And he said what decoloniality does is it brings more candles into the cave, so you can see more of the walls and see more of the, kind of the, the layout of the cave and understand it better. It is not about snuffing that first candle out and replacing it with another candle to wander in the cave with. So I think it is an important consideration, especially with the, I don't know, the, the standard of rhetoric these days on, on things like decoloniality and sort of workers, etc., that it's not about cancelling voices, it's about bringing other voices to the discussion. So nobody's trying to sort of stifle or, or deny a kind of colonial past. They're trying to say, well, let's look at it with other, from other perspectives too. Let's look at it from the perspective of the colonised. Let's try to kind of bring more light into the cave but it's not a case of cancelling any voices. Which is why I think with this, um, the activities at Chillingston do this very well, because uh, Bauer's understanding and the context of, it, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the collection altogether is really well um, preserved, preserved uh, is, I'm not sure it's the right word, but uh, is, is, is there, is contextualised, he's, he's not being kind of cancelled, his, his words aren't being removed from that, and he's, he's kind of, he lives on in the collection. And it also links to this, uh, this uh, sort of quote from, from Santos, uh, that the, as understanding the coexistence of many knowledges in the world and the relation between the abstract hierarchies which constitute them all, unequal and e unequal economic and political power relations. So it's trying to just um, acknowledge this and address it, to bring more voices to the discussion and to listen to those voices and not just from your own kind of, um, through your own lens, try to understand them on their own terms. Because part of the, um, well, actually, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this and I'll come back to that, that strand in a second. So, um, this is a bit of a break. So, we get these, these ideas that you know, the, um, the Buddha was plus sized. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had this. If you're, if, uh, I've never had it with an MA student, but with undergraduates uh, on the first sort of few sessions of teaching uh, Buddhist studies with them, uh, there'd almost always be one who would say any questions about something, you know, a lecture that has nothing to do with. Um, with this particular subject, they say, oh, you know, why was the Buddha fat or something like that? And they say, well, we have no evidence that he was. And they'll say, oh, yeah, but in the garden centre, there's a statue of the Buddha. And it's like, it's really, and you think, go into your degree at the garden centre then. And it's, it come back to that idea about this sort of the, the Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus fighting you know, and those sorts of things. It, it doesn't help that Budai, the character that is plus size, um, Buddha it sounds very much like Buddha to somebody who doesn't isn't that interested in paying attention, but Buddha means kind of a, a knapsack, doesn't it? It's sort of a backpack, or that, that sort of thing. So um, that's one idea. But Buddhists are peaceful. Um, yeah, sure, that, that's there doctrinally, but we should avoid onslaughts onto other beings if, we, if we're Buddhists. Um, that doesn't play out in, in reality, though. You, you, you don't have to look too far to find instances of, of, of Buddhists. Um, committing violence and a Buddhist monks inciting violence. So uh, there is a disjunction, uh, disjunction there, certainly. And Buddhism is more of a philosophy than a religion. Uh, this is deeply problematic because Buddhism is a Western construct, <coughs> and philosophy and religion are both Western terms, and for a Buddhist um, monk or nun, I'm trying to frame this question, which is being confusing as anything. Because they think that these all, like, sort of term, none of these terms relate to me. So why are you trying to analyse me through terms that I can't relate to at all? So it becomes a, a, a big kind of problem. So it's why, you know, 
one Western construct is more of a different type of Western construct than another type of Western construct. It it's all kind of falls into that, 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 sort of, um, uh, uh, that category. So just a couple more slides. I'm not talking too much longer. Um, in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, the main um, effort that I see is really trying to move on from understanding Buddhist thought in Eurocentric terms. So using uh, the, the terminology from um, European philosophy, from Western philosophy, to try to understand, uh, say, Buddhist ethics or Buddhist philosophy, when both of those are actually a little problematic. I mean, the, the term shila in, um, uh, in, in Sanskrit means, it, it gets translated as ethics, but the literal translation is cooling, so it's far more about what, what that's supposed to do to you rather than to, to have you sort of thinking about what you're doing. It's just trying to kind of cool the passions so you can meditate, you can sit on the cushion without distractions. Um, I'm not treating, I think Maria Hine puts this really, really well, uh, very concisely, in that it's, it's not assuming that Western categories are somehow true in an absolute way and valid across a whole range of other ways of thinking. And that all those other ways of thinking are maybe data to be sort of run through Western categories with the judgment popping out the other end. It's, it's trying to understand these Buddhist concepts on their own terms. Of course, people need to get a toehold on the subject before they can move on. So yeah, sure, why not have some scaffolding up there with familiar philosophical terms? But um, with the, the, the MA that I teach on, I try to remove those as quickly as possible as soon as people see that actually they can see it in a different way. That's what, that's what I'm for. Um, and decolonizing museum practices. So I will talk about a couple of, of incidents at the uh, Jimmy's New Parcel um, uh, episode, um, exercise. Uh, but I also note that it, it's not possible at Chillingston to necessarily kind of acquire new material, so you can't have new Tibetan um, art being commissioned or, or being bought to give a, a fresh um, understanding of Tibet as a living culture. Um, unlike, say, uh, National Museums Liverpool, where they had uh, Gonkar Getzel's prints of, um, of my identity. I was trying to find an image of this, um, to pull up, but I couldn't get online. Um, the, I think the Boston Museum of Art has a, has a, a copy of it. Um, but it basically shows the artist Don Cargetso photographed in four different similar but um, similar poses but with different outfits on, uh, tracking his own um, journey through life as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artist who grew up in Tibet uh, with um, he was raised, his family, his, his mother and father were um, Communist Party members and were ardently um, uh, 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 communist. Um, and he only found out there was an alternative to that sort of later in life. Um, so I did want to show this partly because I, I, um, I used to share a flat with Gonkar when he lived in London first in the 1990s. So I, I was going to sort of share an anecdote about his, his um, uh, graduate show, but maybe over, over tea later. I might not leave that for now. Um, so yes, we had uh, the, the only. Uh, when we met in February uh, two years ago now, is it 20, yeah, 2022, um, you can see um, Pema, Tashi Murik, and uh, Tony Passan in the photo there, and Naomi sitting there too. Um, and we, we looked at about maybe a dozen items, um, handles in this, this way. So Naomi told us about how to you know, wear gloves, uh, handle objects low over the table in case you drop them, etc. And this gal was one of the, one of the first items out of the box. And I, I think, well, as soon as you, you picked it up, Tashi, you, the first thing you did was instinctively just opened it. And I'm not sure that anybody had opened it since the uh, Tibetan closed it sometime, maybe or decades, uh, decades earlier. Um, and it did, it demonstrated that that was, you know, you knew there were things in there. And it was, well, what does this say about this person's life? What's going to be sort of, um, Hiding in the other person found important, and um, as, as I think I say, it was it's, the idea of opening was beyond curatorial prurience <laughs> at, that, at that particular point in time, um, and maybe especially without it being sort of documented in any kind of way. But inside the uh, there was a, a, a little um, satsa image, a, a pressed clay image of Bhairava, um, and a, a sundu kind of uh, cord, a um, piece of cloth with a knot in it that you tie around your neck. And the, a lama would have blown a blessing into the knot for your protection, so it's some kind of um, protection knot. Um, and 
Selling said they have, they have to, this is the color chakra, the ten, ten simple color chakra mantra in a stylized form on the cover of that gal. And uh, Selling pointed out that he has, he's got one of those hanging in his car, like a, a similar kind of modern, modern day image. I tried to buy some, it was in Kathmandu in the summer uh, last year, and I tried to buy some amulets like that. I couldn't find anywhere selling them. I can only find like stickers, color chakra stickers, but I'll, I'll keep looking next time I'm there. As I thought it would be maybe. Um, could open up a connection to the, the gift shop at Chillingston, so you could probably buy, buy one of those on the way out if it, if it, if it resonated with you. Or to display in the cabinet, uh, juxtapose perhaps, to, the, uh, to that girl too. Um, and very few, more, very few, few slides now. Um, this uh, Chinook, or as described as a Yua, you know, poor judge for poor um, uh, is is uh, was being displayed slightly incorrectly. So it comes with a bowl, I don't have a picture of it, a bowl and a, a cup. Um, and the, the, the cup is the side of the bowl, it should be inside it. And the idea is you pour water from that uh, tulip over a little round mirror called a melon. It's a polished piece of metal, um, really, with a few dots described on it. And whatever is reflected in that mirror gets purified by the water. Um, <coughs> that's coming out of it. I thought it's, it's really interesting because the provenance of this item um, if you don't know already, it was a gift from the Panchen Lama, described as the Tashi Lama by, uh, by Bauer, uh, to um, Lord Minto, the Viceroy of India, in, I think it was about 1905, I can't remember the exact date. Um, and there's a description there from Bauer's notes about what would happen to things that were gifted to uh, governors and dignitaries and so on, um, if they didn't necessarily want to keep them. So. If a gift like that would be given to the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the Viceroy, if he didn't want to, he couldn't keep it personally without paying for it, but he might want to keep it in his office or have it in his estate or something like that. If he didn't want it, it might be passed on to some other government official who might want to keep it in their kind of, um, uh, in their state-owned collection, not their personal collection. Um, and eventually it would, it would just be sold to an art dealer on the open market. And so this was sold to someone called um, to, to Hopes and Stokes, which I think is a great name. I think if there was ever like a, a kind of a quiz game called something like, is it a kind of a ska DJ or ska MC or Hollywood administrator, Hopes and Stokes would be a great fun, a person to include in that game. Um, and it, eventually it was bought by Bauer. Uh, the, there's some contradictory notes, I think, between this and another side, well, the, the label that Bauer used. Because in this one, I think it says it's kind of, um, it could be late 18th through to 19th century, but he positions it as being 18th century in the, the actual label because that gives it more kind of charisma. The older it is, the more kind of like exotic it is. But it might be a bit later. I don't know, I know very little about Chinese cloisonne work apart from, as I understand it, the kind of, the, it peaked sometime in the mid late 19th century. I'm happy to be correct on this because I really, really don't know much about it. Um, I'd imagine maybe it's more, more at that end, so it's a, a better example of that. But this is a, 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 a gift between um, a really senior Tibetan dignitary, like to, right up at the top, um, and the Viceroy of India. It symbolises a, a political connection. Um, there was a, there was a, a, a reason why the pension was in India and reaching out to Minto. Uh, I won't go into details about that, I don't know enough about it. But it was a, a, a kind of a, a political point of view. I've just got a couple more things to say. Um, in the extension of the other end of this, um, uh, Naomi and I are hoping to uh, run a, a short project on how people encounter these objects uh, when they visit the castle. So what, what are, how are they constructed by, by people who visit? Um, how are they understood? And how do, you, how do they ontologically construct what they encounter the castle? What does the object mean to them? By this I mean some objects might be met with indifference, you know, people just pass through, it looks pretty, don't be care, look next room please, that kind of thing. Some they might see a beauty in them, they might consume them for their aesthetics. And this is maybe a bit of a misunderstanding, certainly with um, Tibetan Buddhist um, art, in inverted commas, as, uh, well, I remember I was at a place called the Lukang in, um, in Lhasa once, a very long time ago, and I got told off by a monk because I described some of the murals in the Lukang as being Yinjibo, so the Gimbo Pesa, Yinjibo, something like that, sorry. Um, and he just went, 
And he said that, you know, they're not Ninjeva, they're Yadbo, they're good. Ninjeva means beautiful. It means there's something sort of pretty and, and lovely and magical and captivating about them. But that's the wrong word to use when you're describing Buddhist art, certainly in the Luke Hang, in fact, Tibetan monk. And he said they should be Yadbo, they're good. If you don't see something good when you see a Buddhist image, it's, that's your fault. You're not seeing the intrinsic nature of that item as being kind of um, uh, the best representation of that is that the person could produce. Um, are the things being historically significant, such as that tulip, do they mark a moment in time and, and are evidence for something, for a connection between two countries um, that is, is often overlooked? Or are they constructed as being actual deities? You know, are these things that are there in, in, in the cabinets seen as being actual deities themselves? I'm not sure that would be the case with many of um, uh statues because if they were um, at one point um, consecrated mid ravnings if they had been filled with, say, incense and semi precious stones and so on, and had the mantra of the deities um, wrapped around spindles, etc., um, those were plundered before they ended up at Chillingston. So they've already been kind of uh, desecrated somewhere else and then they've ended up on the market and they've been there. So it's maybe not quite the same as that. Um, so, yeah, to try to better understand the pose of so many, many knowledges of, um, in the world, in, in, in the sense of trying to understand how different people construct and understand these, uh, these images. I've just got, um, I don't really have a, a specific conclusion to make about that. I hope you've sort of found it interesting. But I would like to say that uh, we're meeting here today on the 12th of March, and that is Tibetan Women's Day. And it commemorates the Tibetan women's uprising in Lhasa in 1959 in response to the Chinese invasion. So I think it's, uh, um, I'm happy to be able to, to mention that here in the context of a Tibetan collection and with Tibetans in the audience as well. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Naomi and Nick, for those fascinating talks um, this evening. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left, and I'm sure there are lots of questions in the audience. Um, and we'd love it if you could um, take a few questions.